Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maxim and I'm going to talk about video cameras in Linux in this talk called From the Camera Sensor to the User, the Journey of a Video Frame. So, uh, as you can probably guess, this is going to talk about video cameras and their support in Linux. Uh, although I'm not going to focus about the software point of view, but rather the hardware itself. Uh, let me just introduce myself, I'm Maxim, uh, I've been working at Bootlin for um, almost three years now, uh, mainly on networking topics and uh, networking files and so on. So when I had the chance a few months back to uh, work on a project uh, involving a video camera, uh, I took kind of the same approach uh, when trying to understand everything that is going on. Uh, that was trying to first understand how the hardware works and then see how it is supported in software. So the goals of this talk would be to discover the various hardware components that are involved in a video camera um, understand how everything chains together, the various configurations that you can find, and see uh, also some real-life designs that you can find uh, as examples. Uh, so first, let's talk about the acquisition hardware by itself. Uh, so to acquire an image, uh, what you will need is um, uh, what we call a, a sensor. Uh, so the sensor is going to acquire the image, trans transform an optical signal into an electrical signal. Uh, before this sensor, you, you have a lot of optical elements that are here to focus the incoming light, filter it and alter it in some ways. And after the sensor, you will have some uh, components that are dedicated to um, transcoding the signal from what the sensor can output into something your system on the chip can understand. So uh, sometimes you don't even need this signal transcoding layer, uh, but you have to know that in some cases you will have to have some uh, intermediary component. So we will basically discuss about uh, each and every one of these components and also how everything interacts with the Linux kernel because we are at ELCE. So uh, let's get back to the, the basics. Uh, what is a sensor and how do we capture an image? So the basic image acquisition setup that I present here is uh, what you are going to find in almost uh, all, uh, all smartphones, camera for example. And also the USB camera I am recording this talk with is uh, basically using the same kind of setup. Um, so to, to acquire an image you need uh, three things. Uh, the first thi thing that you need is an optical signal. So basically incoming light. Uh, incoming light means that you have to be uh, filming something that is in a bright environment. So in some cases you will need uh, some way to enlighten the scene that you are filming. And on smartphones, you will find uh, almost all of the times a powerful uh, LED that, that is uh, very bright and that serves this purpose. Uh, next, you will need some optical elements. So this is here represented by the lens and the voice coil. Uh, so uh, this is a way to uh, deal with the, the focusing of the incoming light beams. And then you have the sensor itself, which is doing the optical to electrical conversion. So first, let's talk about the lens itself. So the lens is going to uh, control the focus of the incoming light. So it is the first thing that the incoming light is going to encounter when it goes uh, into your sensor. Uh, adjusting the lens position is important because it will adjust uh, the, the part of the image that you are going to find that are blurry or very sharp. And depending on the distance of the object you are filming, you are going to want to uh, change the focus of your uh, sensor and therefore uh, physically move uh, the lens uh, closer or further away uh, to your sensor. Uh, most of the time in, in uh, compact uh, sensors, uh, this uh, lens moving is done through a voice coil actuator. So this kind of actuator is very similar in principle to what you find in a, an audio speaker, for example. Uh, the basic idea is that you have a copper wire coil uh, that is uh, attached to the lens and this coil sits inside a static magnetic field that is generated by permanent magnets. Uh, when you pass a current through uh, this coil, you are actually going to move the lens uh, inside the magnetic field. So this is how we actuate uh, the lenses inside our systems. So what you have to do to control the position is actually control the intensity of the current that you are going to pass through the coil. And this is done either through dedicated chips or uh, using just a simple uh, digital to analog converter uh, with the proper analog circuitry. 
and when you're going to implement drivers for that uh, you have the proper uh, support with the media controller API and all of the existing uh, lens coil drivers that are out there and supported in Linux are driven through I2C so this makes it pretty simple to integrate with the system. Next uh, you have the flashlight so it's simply a high power LED so uh, either you are going to control uh, control it through a LED driver or just through a GPIO uh, but you can also find dedicated chips to drive these kind of flashlights uh, these chips will basically have incoming signals such as a strobe signals to have a very precise timing of when you turn on and turn off the light and also sometimes uh, this uh, is used to control what we call the privacy indicator which is the tiny LED that sits next to your sensor and that is on when you are filming and off when uh, the acquisition is, uh, is not ongoing uh, so this is very common on uh, laptops for example so that you know that uh, it is currently filming you uh, once again there are drivers for that supported in, in Linux uh, controlled through I2C and you have also the proper uh, support in the media controller API and video for Linux. And next we're going to talk about uh, the biggest part which is the sensor by itself. So the goal of the sensor is to convert an incoming optical signal into an electrical signal. Uh, to uh, be able to get a full image you are going to divide uh, the real scene into a small uh, element uh, of your picture that are called pixels and the sensor is going actually to do this subdivision for you. Uh, for digital sensors, yeah, there are two widely used technologies, uh, which are CCD and CMOS, uh, although CMOS is the most widely, widely used one uh, as of today. So the basic principle is that uh, for each pixel on your uh, sensor, um, the pixel is going to detect how much light is going into it at a given amount of uh, time, and then uh, this is converted into a voltage. Uh, this voltage is analog and it is read by internal ADCs. But because it is uh, very, very tiny, you first have to go through an, ampli an amplifying stage. This amplifier uh, has to be uh, controllable from the user because um, this will allow you to uh, be able to shoot uh, some scenes in very bright environment. So you set your amplifier to a very low gain or in a very dark environment uh, and then you will set your amplifier to a very high gain but in that case you will also be amplifying the noise from your sensor array. After that some very advanced sensors have a built-in image signal processor uh, but not all of them. Uh, we will see what this is for uh, just after that. And then you have some internal uh, queuing mechanisms and then the data output is done through a dedicated interface. So on most sensors you have a control plane, mostly through I2C, and then a data interface. We're going to see which technologies we can use, but for example we can use the CSI interface. So uh, modern sensors are used to acquire uh, color images. Uh, so our human eyes can see three colors, the red, the green and the blue. Um, and we're going to put filters uh, onto the sensors uh, so that each uh, pixel is going to uh, measure the amount of incoming lights of a particular color. Um, so this is an example of arrangement of uh, the color grid on the, on the sensor. Uh, as you can see, the first line is going to require uh, blue and green, blue and green, and blue and green pixels, and the next line is going to acquire uh, green and red, green and red, and so on. So. Uh, this data is not usable as is. As you can see, there are twice as much green as there are other colors, so this needs to be uh, compensated for. Um, we usually find that the sensors acquire uh, more green than other colors because our eyes are actually more sensible to, to green. Um, the, the action of converting this raw uh, data coming from the sensor into a free component vector called a pixel is called debiring or sometimes uh, demosaicing. This can be done right on the sensor when the sensor uh, embeds an image signal processor or the data can just be transmitted as is uh, to the CPU. In that case we talk about uh, raw data. Um, and then you also need to know uh, in which order your sensor is going to send the data to the CPU. Um, it can be red, green, green, blue, or red, green, blue, green, and so on. There are lots and lots of possible uh, orders in which uh, the colors can be sent. 
So yeah, transforming uh, this uh, raw image into a usable image is uh, possibly a costly operation involving some heavy algorithms. So let's talk about this uh, raw interface. So the, the basic way to transfer data from a sensor up to a CPU is using a raw parallel interface. So it's pretty simple. Uh, you have some data lines uh, that are uh, representing the um, the precision of your analog to digital conversion that you have embedded in your sensor. Uh, so if your ADC has a resolution of 8 bits, you will probably find uh, 8 bits uh, of data parallel data lines on your sensor, on your raw interface, and it can go up to 12 bits. Um, this data is synchronized with the pixel clock, which will tick each time uh, there are new data sent on the data lines. And then you have some synchronization signals. So one is the H-Sync for horizontal sync. Uh, so this one indicates when uh, the sensor is done transmitting a full line of pixels. And then you have the V-Sync, the vertical synchronization signal, which will toggle each time you transmitted a full frame. So with this information, the CPU on the other side is able to reconstruct the image uh, just from the synchronization signals and the data. Um, another widely used interface is the Compact Camera Port 2, so the CCP2. Um, it is a serialized interface, so uh, contrary to parallel interface, data is going to be sent uh, one bit after the other. And in that case, you can notice that there are no HSync and VSync. Um, actually, this synchronization information is embedded into the data. So what you have uh, is just a basic uh, clock lane, uh, so uh, using differential pairs, and the data lanes, so only one of it. So just with four uh, lines, physical lines, you can connect your sensor uh, to your CPU. So this is very useful, but it is pretty limited in bandwidth. Uh, it can only go up to 650 megabits per second. So um, next, there is a very widely used interface. It's actually uh, a standard, which is the CSI standard uh, from the, um, the MyPy Alliance. Um, it is very familiar to people who uh, are uh, used to work with networks uh, because it is divided into several layers. Uh, a file layer uh, dealing with the physical uh, transmission of the data over uh, electrical signals. Then you have a lane management layer, so uh, we will see what this is used for. Uh, it's mainly uh, about splitting data uh, in multiple lanes uh, to transmit your, your information. Then you have a low-level protocol layer which deal with uh, checksumming and error correction, and then the application layer. So uh, this one is mostly dealing with the pixel to byte conversion. So how do you represent a pixel uh, on the wire uh, in, your, in your CSI interface? Uh, the version 2 of this standard is the most widely used, although there exists a CSI version 3. An interesting thing about uh, this standard is that the file layer is actually shared with another standard that is widely used, which is the TSI standard, uh, which deals with displays. So the file layer is exactly the same for DSI and CSI. So let's talk about this file layer. Uh, there are several variants of it. Um, one that is found in most cases is the DFI layer. So as you can see, it is pretty similar to CCP2. Uh, it's also a serialized interface. Uh, the synchronization signals are also embedded into the data. The main difference is that you can support multiple data lanes uh, to transmit data in parallel. So you can have up to four lanes uh, and go up to six gigabits per second. So this is starting to be a very fast interface. And then the other widely, not, not widely used, but the other file layer that you can use with CSI is the C file layer. So this one is much more complex. Um, I'm going to talk a bit into more details about that because um, what we saw uh, as of right now are pretty familiar stuff. We are used to see uh, clock lanes and uh, differential pairs to transmit uh, high bandwidth data. Uh, coming from the networking stuff, uh, this is very familiar. Uh, however, the T-file layer works very differently. So you also have the synchronization data uh, in included inside the data, but the clock is also embedded into the data. So this is also something that is familiar. The clock is reconstructed on the other side of the link. 
However, instead of using a differential pair, we are using a trio of wires. So uh, the data is conveyed uh, on three uh, wires uh, working all together. And instead of using just a binary to transmit the data, so with uh, high and low signals, um, on each line you are going to have three level signals. You have high, medium and low electrical voltages. Uh, and you have some constraints. So for example, uh, two lines cannot have uh, the same level at a given time. So if one line is in high, the next one must be in medium and the third one must be in low. And so therefore you have only six combination uh, of signals that you can have with these three uh, lines. Uh, moreover, in order to be able to reconstruct the clock on the other side, uh, each time you send data, so a symbol, uh, you must not send twice the same symbol over the, the lane, uh, so that at each uh, clock tick, your, all of your uh, signal level changes. So this limits us to uh, only uh, five possible symbols that can be sent over this wire. So this is why this is uh, an interface working in quinary system, so base 5. Uh, in order to, to convert the incoming binary data into these uh, quinary uh, symbols, um, they use a 16 to 7 uh, ratio of conversion. So 16 bits of data are transmitted uh, using only 7 symbols uh, in quinary. So this allows us to uh, drastically reduce the clock rate on the, in the lanes and you can use at most three lanes in parallel going therefore up to 41 gigabits per second so this is a very fast uh, physical layer uh, but it's not uh, as straightforward to understand and implement uh, compared to the other ones this is why it's um, not as prevalent as the DeFi uh, layer uh, let's talk a bit about uh, analog then so what we saw as of right now was digital transmission protocols okay so we were assuming that we were dealing with a digital sensor. But um, analog video representation is still something that is going on. So it has a very, very uh, long history and uh, a long legacy uh, stuff going on. Uh, starting uh, almost a hundred years from now, uh, that was the, the first video broadcast. Um, so uh, by then they have some interesting uh, constraints. For example, uh, one thing that they have to, de to deal with is that some people had uh, black and white televisions in their houses and other people had uh, color televisions. Uh, how do we send a video signal in analog that is going to be compatible with both black and white televisions and uh, with uh, color TVs? Uh, you cannot just send an RGB signal uh, because the, the black and white uh, televisions will either uh, display only the red component or the green component or the blue component and this will give a very distorted view of the original image. Instead, what they did is that they shifted the color space. So there were three main standards uh, at this time, uh, PAL, NTSC and CCAM. So um, PAL was mostly used in Europe, NTSC in USA and Japan and CCAM was mostly used in France, Eastern Europe and the former USSR. So the main idea of uh, shifting this color space is to have one component representing the black and white signal, uh, which is called the luminance or luma signal, and then two other components uh, carrying the information about the colors. So these are called the chrominance signals or chroma. So by doing so, uh, you have two main advantages. The first one is that if you transmit your luminance signal over the frequency that the black and white televisions were designed for, they are still going to uh, display your black and white image correctly. If you uh, then also transmit the chrominance information on other carrier frequency, you can uh, also design uh, color TVs which will be compatible with the same signals. The other main advantage of that is that uh, actually the human eyes are much more sensitive to black and white information uh, than to color information. Uh, so when the brain interprets things that it is seeing, it is mostly basing its analysis on the black and white luminance information. This means that we can compress the chrominance information uh, with loss and therefore transmit data uh, with a higher throughput. 
So uh, this is still used as of today in, in some, some cases. And these standards were designed to represent how we transmit uh, video signals over analog. Um, most of the time, uh, what the TV did uh, is that they synchronized their uh, clocks uh, to the power grid in the country. So um, for PAL, uh, which means in Europe, uh, we have a 50 hertz uh, electrical grid. Um, and therefore, uh, most of the, the standards using PAL uh, to transmit video run at either 50 frames per second or 25 frames per second. In NTSC, so in USA, um, the power grid is at 60 Hz, that's why NTSC mostly deals with 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second signals. Um, in order to deal with this, uh, 25 frames per second is pretty low and the human eye can start to notice um, then the, that the, the image uh, is not very smooth. So in order to increase the perceived frame rate, what they invented is the process of interlacing. So this means that when the video was acquired uh, by the camera at the time, uh, what they did is for one frame they uh, only acquired the odd lines and for the other frame, they acquire the uh, even lines. So you have pretty much, each frame is only representing half of the image, uh, but with a, a, a space between each line. Uh, and then you would transmit uh, this information. You have only to transmit half as much information as if you were transmitting a full frame. So this half information is called a field, and you will transmit uh, these fields at either 60 or 50 fields per second. When displaying that on a CRT television, uh, the CRT actually displays the image in exactly the same process. So it would display the image uh, every other line and switching back, back and forth between uh, odd and even lines at each frame. So um, the, this was very smooth to watch uh, on a CRT television, uh, but when you want to display that on a more modern uh, digital screen, um, you don't have the same uh, displaying mechanisms in place and therefore you have to display the full frame at any given time. So this means that you have to wait for the two fields to come in, join them and display them. But when you do so, uh, you start to notice some very bad artifacts as shown in this picture. So if the, the object that you are filming is moving very fast uh, horizontally, you will, ha will have some interlacing artifacts uh, displaying some uh, double images with some weird shadowing effects. So removing these artifacts uh, is a process called the deinterlacing. And deinterlacing is not easy to do at all. So if you want to have a deinterlacing de uh, component inside your video pipeline to display a proper image that is coming from an analog source, uh, you will probably need uh, either an, an advanced uh, image signal processor or use your CPU to do the conversion. So um, there exist some transcoders that are uh, used to convert an analog signal into a digital signal. Uh, so I had to work with one of those. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm talking about this. This is also supported with, with uh, the video for Linux and media controller frameworks. Uh, so the goal is to convert analog signals into digital signals. Um, uh, most of the time these decoders will support all of the existing standards uh, and they can embed a small image signal processor to do some very basic uh, processing on the image such as cropping and scaling but also do some deinterlacing for the advanced one. Uh, there exists a standard to uh, convert uh, to convey uh, converted analog data onto a digital uh, interface. So these are the VT656 and VP1120 uh, uh, standards. So they, they uh, indicate how do we represent uh, the transcoded data onto uh, most of the time a parallel interface. So in that case, what you are going to transmit over the interface is um, most of the time images using the Y, U and V uh, color space. And then you have the host interface. So this is what you are going to find inside your system on the chip. So what I uh, show you here uh, is a very basic uh, interface. Uh, you have to know that every uh, vendor has its own way of doing stuff. 
sometimes including image processor, sometimes not, uh, sometimes with a, a firmware running inside of it, and so on. So basically your host interface is a collection of hardware, bl hardware blocks uh, inside your SOC. Uh, you have a block that is dealing with the file layer, so uh, decoding the, 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 the incoming signal. And then you have uh, some image processing that is going on, uh, so possibly scaling or cropping, deinterlacing, uh, changing the, the, the format of the pixels and so on. And then the camera interface is going to store this uh, into a buffer, into memory using DMA. So uh, you have a full support for all of these blocks uh, with the video for Linux framework. Um, inside the, the ISP, so the, the image signal processor, um, you can do a lot of various things. So sometimes it is a very, very small block that is embedded inside your camera interface that just deals with cropping, for example. So cropping is the action of removing areas from an image. So uh, getting rid of information that you don't really care about to resize your image. Scaling, on the other hand, is uh, changing the dimension of your image without losing uh, information, or at least with losing uh, at least information as possible. You still want the full frame to be displayed, but just in a larger or, or a smaller format. So this requires very complex algorithms to do so. Uh, so the scaling operation is an advanced feature. Then you have the interlacing, so recompose an interlaced train. Uh, just the action of joining the fields back together is very easy to do. Uh, however, removing the artifacts requires heavy image processing. Then you have actions such as changing the pixel format, so uh, debayering, for example, so converting raw data from a sensor into uh, pixels, or changing the color space. And then you have um, a collection of algorithms, which are called the 3A algorithms, so auto-exposure, auto-focus, and auto-white balance. So auto-exposure means uh, adjusting the brightness of an image. So in my case, uh, here I think I'm a bit too white, so um, my sensor's gain is a bit too high. Uh, so the process of uh, adjusting that requires a feedback with the sensor. So uh, you will basically measure uh, how bright your image is and then uh, lower or uh, higher your, your sensor's gain. So this can be done uh, by software, of course, but some image signal processors uh, can help you uh, offload that for you. Um, the autofocus process is uh, the action of moving the lens back and forth, making sure the subject that you are filming stays in focus. So this is also pretty complex to do, and you also have to feed back uh, the information up to your uh, lens driver. The auto white balance, on the other hand, is purely uh, an action on, on the software side, uh, or can be offloaded, but you don't need to feed back to the sensor. It's the action of uh, making sure that the whites in your image are really white. Um, so in some cases, this is pretty common to see uh, when people are filming inside, uh, the image tends to be a bit orange. And when they are filming outside, the image tends to be a bit blue. And you can adjust so that uh, the whites uh, are really white and not orange or blue. And you also have to change all of the other colors uh, so that this matches this correction. So uh, there are powerful algorithms to do so, and then th this can also be uh, offloaded in image signal processors. So there was a, a very interesting talk uh, earlier today by Helen, um, who is talking about upstreaming a driver for uh, ISP processors on work platforms, I think. So uh, let me give you a few examples of devices uh, that are supported uh, in Linux. Uh, one that I found very interesting is the Nokia uh, N900, so this is a very old platform. Um, it, it, it dates back from uh, 2009, I think. Um, what, what is interesting is that it has a full Linux support, um, and the sensor uh, is completely controlled through, through Linux, so you have a flash LED driver, uh, you have a lens voice coil driver and a sensor driver, everything is controlled by the CPU. So if you want to, to write a, con a sensor that is uh, fully supported in Linux, this is a, a good example to, to, to look at. So you can, uh, you can find the device tree inside the, the Linux kernel. Uh, another example is a project that I've been working on. So I can only give you a few details about that, but it's based on a rock chip, uh, a system on a chip. And um, 
one of the particularities is that we had an analog video source uh, that can be uh, PAL or NTSC and we don't really know when we start streaming so we have to perform some automatic detection inside the decoder uh, the decoder is going to uh, convert this analog data into uh, digital data uh, and it is conveyed about uh, uh, on a parallel bus uh, using PT656 um, it is using the VIP uh, camera interface from Rockship, so the streaming is in progress, uh, same as the decoder, the streaming is in progress too. In our cases, we don't do image processing uh, to do the real deinterlacing. We are simply joining the fields together, um, and therefore uh, we have to accept that we have uh, artifacts inside our final video. Um, as for the support in Linux, uh, all the components that I've talked about are supported by Linux, so you have support for uh, lenses, flashlights, uh, sensors, decoders, camera interfaces uh, through the video for Linux, and the media controller APIs, uh, so uh, the community is very welcoming. Uh, an interesting pr uh, project to follow is the Leap Camera project. Um, there is a very interesting talk by Laurent Panchard uh, about that. Uh, who, who explains how to deal with uh, very complex cameras like that uh, that have uh, complex sensors and complex camera interfaces inside the SOC uh, the pipeline is very convoluted and how do we deal with that in user space so this is very interesting and I, I encourage you to look at that um, so thank you for, for listening um, in conclusion the numbers of technologies can be uh, a bit overwhelming when you are starting to discover the, the video world, but uh, it's basically the same thing for networking world, so uh, I was not very surprised by that. Um, but it's also interesting to see that um, the old, old analog uh, technologies and terminologies still apply today, and uh, the legacy of uh, the hundred years of uh, video acquisition and transmission can still be useful today. Uh, the ideas are, are very interesting. Uh, the, the Linux support is, is very good, uh, although there are lots of various different hardware, uh, the support is good. Um, the, the community is very friendly, and uh, using Video for Linux and the Media Controller API, you can have very, very complex use cases uh, implemented in Linux. So, thank you for listening, and I will now try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.